The forensic pathologist, Dr. Steve Naidu, says one of the shortcomings in the manner in which the autopsy of anti-apartheid activist Dr. Neil Agard was conducted was the failure to examine his body for possible internal bruises. Yesterday, Naidu expressed concern that the death scene was not examined as required by the state's chief pathologist or a district surgeon before Agard's body was removed. I want to get the very latest now and bring in a reporter that's been covering this case uh, very closely, Nuzan Tom. Mia, she's live for us at the Johannesburg High Court. Nozi, a very good morning to you too. Take us through some of uh, Dr. Nida's uh, testimony yesterday. What were some of the biggest takeaways? Well, a very good morning to you, Blaine. You're quite right. Uh, you know, Dr. Nida criticized uh, uh, the district uh, surgeon as well as other health authorities uh, in their handling of uh, this particular matter. And he says, according to the regulations that were in place as far back as uh, the 1950s in terms of uh, health practices and health and safety standards, uh, it was a standard and it was law that any uh, deaths of political prisoners uh, in prison or while in detention had to be investigated by the most senior doctor in that particular district. And uh, in the case of Neil Agat, it seems as though um, this was only followed to a partial extent. Uh, and he criticized the police's handling of Neil Agat's uh, body once it had been cut down from his cell uh, and the hours that it had taken for them to transport his body from the John Forster Square Police Station to the state mortuary. And he says that in that time, uh, you know, uh, forensic pathologists should have waited for a full detailed report from the police before they conducted any autopsies because conducting the autopsy before sufficient time had passed would have meant that they would have missed out on seeing on any of the bruises that could have um, led them to discovering exactly what had caused Neil Agat's death. So it almost seemed as though there was a cover-up uh, by district uh, officials, district health officials, to cover up what really caused uh, Neil Agat's uh, death. Was it that Neil Agat had been beaten and tortured to such an extent that uh, security police decided that they would cover their misdeeds, string him up, and stage a suicide? Or was it that Neil was so overcome by the horrors of that particular torture, he decided to commit suicide? And, you know, Dr. Naidu is saying because of the clumsy manner in which uh, the autopsy and the handling of Dr. Neil Agard's body was conducted, we may never know those answers. Yeah, that's the, that's the big question, I guess. Uh, and this whole inquest, I guess, hinges on that, in fact. We also heard from yet another detainee uh, yesterday, Nozi. We heard from uh, Jabo Nguenya, and he was talking about the days leading up uh, to uh, Dr. Neil Agat's death and he was talking about the day before where he saw this whole lot of commotions. He was in a cell and he had this gut feeling. Tell us about this gut feeling that he had. So, you know, Blaine, what's quite interesting about uh, the detainees uh, that were there on that night, the night of the 4th of February, is that you know, some of the, uh, with the accounts that they had seen don't necessarily corroborate with each other's accounts. So Nguenya said that he heard a commotion um, by Neil Agat's uh, uh, cell. And that's when he started to see all the security police move towards Neil Agat's cell, block off the windows and block off uh, any of the peepholes towards uh, the cell entrance or the cell gate. But, uh, you know, the witness that we had earlier this week was saying he saw Neil Agat's body being moved from um, the interrogation room towards the stairs away from his cell. So there does seem to be a bit of a discrepancy in terms of what exactly they saw. This is why, Blaine, it's so critical for state prosecutors to get the details of those security police officers that were part of Neil's interrogation, to call them to court, to subpoena them to court, so that they can give their account 
account of what exactly had happened because they would have had um, watches. They would have been aware of the time. They would have been able to get access to the occurrence book to be able to see what the truth of the matter was. The detainees were in darkness half yeah. the time. Their, um, you know, their minds were quite addled at the time because they were dealing with the issue of the trauma. They didn't have access to radios. They didn't have access to watches. So time frame and time referencing for them was quite difficult. And they were also so disorientated. They yes. couldn't quite tell what day it was. So it could be that it had happened over, over a week or in, on two different days. But their recollection, 38 years down the line, their recollection yeah. uh, has clumped everything together in one night. Such an important point you raised there, Nozi, and I'm sure that will be taken into consideration. So what can we expect today? So today we're definitely expecting uh, the conclusion of Dr. Stephen Naidu's uh, uh, expert uh, witness. Ah. It's a pity that we lost Nosy, but you got uh, the gist of uh, her reporting. We're expecting that uh, Dr. Stephen Naidu uh, will uh, take the stand. He'll resume his testimony and talk about his expertise in this field and what he thinks uh, is the cause of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Agat's death. Uh, that's happened in 1982, 38 years ago. We just um, observed the, uh, the anniversary of his death uh, a few days ago. So that indeed uh, will be very interesting to watch. It doesn't mean me a life for us in uh, the Johannesburg High Court.